All right, here we are, another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kuder, local realtor with Sutton Group Ottawa. And today I'm joined with one of my really good friends. We've been friends for a little over 25 years, Dr. Ahmed Al Masri, Director of Health Services at Apex Health. Ahmed, it's been a while. We've been trying to do this. And thank you so much, first of all, for giving us the time. Thanks for having me. It's a great opportunity. Really appreciate, appreciate it. it. And Ahmed comes from a family of doctors. Tell me a little bit more about that. So me and my younger brother are both physicians. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things where your parents expect you to do it. And you want to initially rebel. You don't want to do it. And then you realize, you know what? It's actually a good calling to have. Yeah. So we both went down that way. I am a family physician and an emergency medicine doctor. I've been practicing in Ottawa for the last 10 years. I do a hybrid of family med, emergency med, and then lately we switched gears and we'll talk about that. Amazing. And about the calling, you know, this is like the, the Palestinian dream, right? Like it's either you become a doctor or you become a, an engineer. That's true. It's very rare that you find a family that's pushing for something else. That's true. That's true. Obviously, it doesn't mean that we're all doctors and engineers, but it's probably one of the highest per capita countries in the world with doctorship or like a PhD. Yeah, I don't know the stats, but I think you're right because families aspire to have their kids either doctors and engineers. And I'd like to put one more, couple more categories in there. I think people should pursue their passions. 100%. And we need a bit more lawyers <laughs> in yeah. our community. Of course, I think course. That, that's, human uh, rights lawyers for sure. That's right, yeah. that's right. And then more artists, art is underrepresented in our culture too. Mm -hmm. And I think we're getting there. Amazing, man. So what got you turned on to healthcare? You know, you did say at the beginning it was the family, but then after that you got into it. What got you so triggered? So choosing to become a doctor is a tough decision because it's a lifelong process. Yeah. Even now I'm practicing 10 years. I have to always learn. I'll always keep up to date. As I was in high school, I was exploring what would I, do I want to do engineering basically or medicine or sciences. As soon as I did a programming course in high school, I was like, okay, I really don't like that stuff. Mm -hmm. I had always an interest in biology, science. And medicine was the right combination. So you can be a scientist, but you can also be fit, like human interactions, right? You deal with people. Yeah. And you make a huge difference. When I when I see someone and I and I pick up a disease and I treat it, the reward you get from that is is intangible. It's obviously, massive, yeah. Of course. And then um, <clears throat> it's nice to be in the community in Ottawa. Thankfully, I'm very well respected here. I look forward to kind of seeing my patients. I like both the hybrid of Emerge and Family Med because Emerge has a bit more acute care. I'm dealing with heart attacks, strokes, fractures, things like that. And then in the family practice, it's more of continuity of care. They call it from cradle to grave. So when you have a kid, I take care of them until you're older and we go from there. Lately, however, me and my colleague, Dr. Nehme, uh, we opened a new healthcare facility, Apex Health. Mm -hmm. This one is actually specifically geared for men's health. So. Over the last few years, we've realized that several men would come approach us about men's health issues. Poor weight gain, poor muscle gain, yep. takes them quite a while to get back after exercise, the recovery is prolonged. And often one of the reflexes, they ask us about testosterone essentially, and if it's something that they would benefit from. And most knee-jerk reflex for doctors, like we don't wanna deal with this. That's not something we get into because we're not comfortably trained with it, because a lot of people, there's a stigma around abuse of it, things like that. So me and him realized there's a need and we wanted to flip the script. Yeah. Instead of shunning patients away, we delved into this, we, we've gained a lot of training around this and we've opened a clinic that's dedicated for men. Yeah, it's a, I like the fact that you said flip the script. It's like, it's, it sounds like you guys are literally swimming upstream in a way. That's uh, it. When everybody's going one way, you wanna go the, the other yeah. way and that's, Probably one of the reasons why it's, it's definitely going to be something that's really successful and well received. Thank you. Why the name Apex? What what got you guys choosing that particular name? It's a, it's a play on themes and play on words, essentially. Apex is we're trying to get patients to their peak health or mm -hmm. apex health. And then a notion that men want to be in their apex performance. Yeah in various domains. So the name kind of signifies what we want to get out of our patients, get them to their peak health, their apex health. Mm -hmm. It's kind of where we thought of it. And it's a simple name, yeah. Oh, it's amazing. It's uh, Again, yeah, the name speaks volumes for what you guys are trying to accomplish. So tell me a little bit more about the practice and why did you choose that particular testosterone therapy that you guys are you know, looking to do when everybody's going away from it or everybody's yeah. saying no to it? So a couple of things. The specific Apex Health is unique in the sense that it's more of an executive style clinic. 
So it's not going to be that rushed experience where you go into your doctor and you're going to have 15 minutes to crunch your questions. No, we're going to take our time with you. We're going to deal with all the concerns that you may have as a gentleman or as a man. A lot of men either are interested in testosterone, and let's be blunt, there's a population of men who use anabolic steroids for performance enhancing. And again, that's something typically doctors kind of shun away. They judge. They're like, we don't want to deal with this. Yep. We're that no judgment zone. Come here. Whether you're doing it, we're not going to promote you doing anabolic steroids. If you're doing it, we're here to support you in a harm reduction fashion. Think of it like that. Mm -hmm. We're going to manage all the health risks around it. We're going to consider doing routine blood works for you. We're going to look at your bone health, heart health, metabolic panels. And then we're going to tell you maybe you should slow off, cool off of this and that. So that one stream of people who are potentially using anabolic steroids, we're here in a non-judgmental zone to help them manage that. And then for the other population of men who just can't find the answers for them, they want testosterone therapy, their doctor's like, no, I don't deal with this stuff. You know what? Come talk to us about it. We'll see if you're a good fit. There's new your, uh, Canadian neurology guidelines that have given us kind of a bit of leeway. So if someone has a low normal testosterone with a constellation of symptoms, it's not unreasonable for us to give a trial of testosterone therapy for three, six, nine months and see if that makes a difference. Yeah, I've been kind of researching about this quite often, I guess, as a man getting into my 40s, it uh, it kind of hits you every now and then. Yeah, like recovery takes long, uh, yeah. you know, being in the morning, being a little bit on takes a little bit longer. You, know, you might need a couple of coffees before you, you start getting there. What makes that level of testosterone in the body just kind of goes down along the years. Like, tell me a little bit more about it for the Fair audience enough. that are watching. So there's a couple of physiological changes that happen, whether we like it or not, with aging. So your testosterone production starts decreasing incrementally with age. Mm -hmm. So there's a linear curve going downwards with testosterone production. The reality is most people have sufficient testosterone to meet their needs. But sometimes people feel, honestly, when you hit your late 30s, 40s, you start feeling that you have a bit of a deficiency in yeah. it. And there's probably up to 10% of the population that do have a true deficiency. Some of those are truly pathological. They have like a tumor, they have a testicular pathology, and those things that we work up, obviously. The rest of the population, they should have that slow decline. And that's something we kind of look for and see if, if it's something that's, that's there and it needs to be addressed, essentially. Yeah. Uh, some of the symptoms to go on, uh, like you said, poor muscle recovery. A lot of people notice that they don't have the morning erections anymore. That's one of the things that they have. Their libido has gone down. Yeah. Their sexual appetite has changed. Even though part of them wants it, their body's kind of like, ah, not quite there yet. There's a mismatch where your mind is and where your body is. Yeah, yeah. So what are some of the, um, I guess, the nuances that come with it that men should look for to you know, justify possibly going in and test and see how things are? Fair enough. So... Poor difficulty losing weight, that muscle fat. Yep. is It's harder to gain muscles at the gym. It's you wake up, again, feeling sluggish. A lot of people feel depressed. They have fogginess in their head. They have headaches. They have low mood. They're irritable. A lot of the symptoms actually kind of almost line up like they are in depression. But we try not to assume it's depression unless we ruled out organic causes. And this is one of the big organic causes. The truth is, aside from low testosterone, there's a lot of other comorbid conditions that patients may have that contribute to them feeling like this. Mm -hmm. uh, untreated sleep apnea, that's a big thing that we often miss. So that's something we look for. Let's be honest, obesity is a big part. So yeah. actually uh, being obese lowers the body's testosterone. So dealing with that alone helps improve uh, your baseline testosterone in your blood. Kind of a vicious cycle because like, I mean, you need it to be able to work out and do all of that stuff. But then, you know, having that extra fat prevents you from it and it just like it's like really just kind of a vicious cycle so you guys Correct. are there to like at least figure a way to maybe inject some sort of a you know like a life into it and to try Correct. to get that you get you out of that cycle yeah so i think what we'll do is we'll explore we'll do a full assessment for you we have a new machine called InBody, which does a full InBody analysis mm -hmm. it takes like 30 60 seconds it gives us a, a full breakdown of your body fat content your muscle content and it gives you segmental distribution. So it tells you your arm has more muscle, your leg has more fat. So it gives us an idea how to kind of start and work around. But we'll call you out. We'll say, okay, not just testosterone. You need to lose weight. You need to look at this and that. So those are things we need to address, not just testosterone, but beyond that. Yeah. 
And we're going to take a more preventative approach as well, as we always do in medicine. So with that being said, I mean, some of the things that, again, it's been looked at lately, a lot of, uh, you know, it's something that a lot of just the media and the industry and all of that, it, lo- it looks, most people don't look at it as something favorable to do. Yeah. Why are you, why are you guys thinking the other way around and what, what, you know, what's got you thinking that way to help men do this? So we're uh, with this gig economy, with online, the truth is if someone's putting their mind to doing it, you can literally go on a website, Canadian steroids, anabol- something like the anabolicsteroids.com and order it and ship it to your house and start using it. So if someone is bent on doing something, they're going to do it. Yeah. So we're trying to say, you know what? No, let's do it in a supervised fashion. Let's see if you're, if it's warranted to do it. So one approach in medicine is, again, shunning people away. Don't smoke. I'm not going to see you if you smoke. Versus, you know what? Come, you're a smoker. I'll see you. And let's try to get you not smoking by talking about it versus just not giving you a chance to discuss your health. Yeah. There's a lot of misconceptions around treatment. If someone's going to go do it on their own, they're not going to know what parameters to use, when to stop, what causes it can have effect on their liver, things like that, hematocrit. Mm -hmm. So, and we know for a fact, a lot of men are looking at this. This is kind of uh, an unmet need in our community. So why not be there for them? Sounds good. And if I had to describe, like, you know, after this conversation, I'm going to go out and probably talk about Apex Health. If I have to describe it to someone, what sort of, uh, I guess, avenues do you guys deal with when it comes to healthcare that I could talk about? So, again, big thing is a TRT or testosterone replacement, but we do a lot of different things. So for a lot of men who, who care about, like, rejuvenation, we actually do Botox for, fi- for the face to keep you looking younger. We do Botox for hyperhidrosis, for the sweating in the armpits and the hands. That's a big thing. The treatment uh, is often covered by insurance. And it lasts for six to eight months. It's beautiful, like the sweating. We do PRP for ha- for hair loss, and then we give medications as well for hair loss. Oh, we, I didn't know PRP is something that you could use for health. I thought it was mostly for muscles and like joints and things. PRP like that. is one of those again evolving things. They realize they can take out your blood, <laughs> spin it, take the platelets, and inject it in different places. So it's it's useful for the the vampire facial they call it, rejuvenate the face. But it also we found that when you inject into the hair follicles. It prolongs the, there's three phases of hair growth. It keeps the hair in the hair growth phase longer. Mm-hmm. So it prevents the hair from being lost. It doesn't necessarily promote the cells from not from dying, but it keeps you in that phase. So for men who want to, who have some hair loss, they want to increase the fullness, PRP is useful to augment with other medications. And it's healthy too. It's just like your oh, own yeah. blood. Like of you, course. Yeah. What can go wrong. Yeah. And often a lot of people <clears throat> have health spending accounts on their insurance and they cover that. Uh, one additional thing we have in our clinic, we have a massage expert, massage therapist, RMT expert who's joining us. He has a holistic approach. He actually does a bit of naturopathic medicine. And so he has different approach. He's more therapeutic massage. He's not one of those like you go in and relax. He actually treats pathology. Mm-hmm. So we have that as an option. We're going to have a dietitian on board. If someone's kind of gets is lost in their journey to improve their way of eating. We're going to get a dietitian on board. Again, most likely covered by their insurance. Help them navigate what to change about their diet to get them to where they want to be. And what about the testosterone treatment? Is that also covered by insurance or is that something that's... uh... So our clinic fee is not covered by OHIP. It's kind of a membership uh, platform where you you sign up. There's a a cost per visit and then or a membership for three, four visits a year. Mm -hmm. Again, I think some insurance policies will cover that because they have a health spending account, so they can leverage that for their services with us. Uh, blood work is covered by OHIP, and then prescription treatments are of- often covered by by their insurer. So if we do decide to, to prescribe testosterone in any of the fashions, gel, injections, intranasal, that's often covered by the insurance. Yeah. There's other therapies that may be uh, compounded and off-label, uh, again, it's hard to say. Every insurance provider is a bit different. It's it, interesting to say because, like, we, you know, a lot of the times where, you know, you, you get that sort of head fog and this and that, and like you're thinking, okay, I'm maybe suffering from depression, and I'm I'm one to say, like, at the end of the day, like, you know, mental health is very very important. I, you know, I do get those episodes here and there where I'm like, okay, I'm really foggy and I need some time to unplug. What got you thinking that you know there is other causes other than just the depression? Yeah, the term andropause is kind of uh, 
sometimes used for the equivalent of menopause. And there's truth in that. So men, we often, sometimes it's easy to say, oh yeah, you're just depressed. But if someone's not normally depressed and it's not in their personality or there's no specific precipitant for depression, we should start looking at an organic cause. Mm -hmm. Whether it's low testosterone, whether it's untreated sleep apnea, whether it's uncontrolled diabetes that hasn't been picked up, uncontrolled hypothyroidism, there's a constellation of organic or medical conditions that we have to rule out before we call it depression. And sometimes it really is depression, not something we can deal with as well. Yeah. And how, like, I guess, how would you guys rule if it's this or that? Like, what, what sort of indications, it's one way or another? Is it mostly blood tests? Is it mostly... So part of it is doing a blood uh, biochemical assay. We'll check your testosterone profile. We'll check FSH, estradiol. We'll check your CBC. We'll check your iron stores, B12. Kind of a complete blood panel. A lot of the diagnosis in medicine we actually do. I remember one of my preceptors, 80% of the diagnosis we make is by history, 80%, 20% by, by an exam or blood tests. So often by talking to you, we can try to sort out what the cause is. I'll be honest, sometimes patients feeling unwell in an older gentleman can sometimes be a sign of hidden heart disease. Mm -hmm. You just feel breathless when you exercise without getting classic chest pain. We work you up and you have uh, coronary artery disease and you need... Uh, stents in your heart. Oh, so wow. that's where obviously being a clinician, you have to kind of pay attention to all the signs and symptoms and put the pieces together, try to sort it out. So it, it sounds like you're doing a lot of prevention medicine, which is something that, you know, a lot of, we're really behind. I feel like as a society here in Canada, we're pretty behind with that. It's, it's mostly like, like, let's just treat the fire when it happens. It's often reactive. Exactly. Versus, okay, well, Let's take a look at more holistic and see what's going on with Correct. you and, and do all of that. Uh, and how long you guys have, you know, been thinking of this idea? Like, where did it come to fruition? So, actually, around a year ago, uh, I had a friend overseas. He started telling me that he went on a medicine called Clomid, which is a treatment. Unfortunately, the company doesn't make it, but we can compound it. It promotes endogenous testosterone. He was having the symptoms. He went on it, and he feels great. So then I had a flashbulb moment, and I went to Dr. Naim. I'm like, you know what? This is not something that we can, that's often dealt with in Canada. There's no clinics dealing with men's health. There's all sorts of clinics for women's health, and that's great. But there's nothing for men's health exclusively where we take the time. So we're like, you know what? This is something we should look into. And we did a needs analysis. Yeah, there isn't much going on in Ottawa and in Ontario. There's yeah. a couple of clinics maybe in Toronto. And the biggest thing I find, like, I didn't, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, but as a man, I'm speaking a little bit for myself, we have this sort of shame. Like we don't want to be talking about how we're feeling. We don't want to be talking about what's going on with us. We don't like, we're really kind Macho of Macho type of, yes. Exactly. We're reserved in, in a way that we just, like we keep it to ourselves uh, and we think it's, it's strength. Yeah. Um, how are we breaking that cycle? So part of it is having a place that is exclusive for men where you come in, you feel like you're not judged. Everyone else is experiencing the same thing. Yeah. Uh, versus going to uh, like a medi spa, which we're not. Uh, we're, we're, we're a clinical practice. But I'm giving an example. Imagine a guy wanting to do Botox. He doesn't want to go to a medi spa, sit around. Uh, he may feel judged. He may feel like, oh, I shouldn't be here. So this kind of creates a safe zone, a safe environment. They can come and talk to us about things. A man's club, but it's men's health. So uh, it's a place where you can come and discuss things. We know we're going. Th people go through these things. I think giving the people an opportunity or an avenue to discuss it in a non non-judgmental fashion will likely have people explore it. Yeah. And a lot of people, you're right. They think about it, they Google it, but they never really deal with it, or they go through online acts or things that are not mm -hmm. like uh, official. Yeah. And, and that's or safe. Yeah. And that's really the, the biggest sort of concern for someone like myself is like, okay, well, you know, I'm, I might be experiencing this. My doctor is more of a generalist. He doesn't really, like at the end of the day, fantastic doctor, but he's a generalist. This is something that, you know, you could look into without necessarily harming yourself by doing it on your own. to online Correct. or on, Correct. on your own or somebody from a back alley trying to sell you some steroids or whatever that is. That's it. Unfortunately, the way healthcare system is set up, uh, doctors are crunched for time. So my clinic is booked 25, 30 patients back to back, right? And most often patients have taken two, three weeks to get a hold of me. Mm -hmm. So when they come in, they have three, four, five issues and I have 10, 15 minutes to discuss it with them. Sometimes I take longer, obviously, if someone is, is in need. But so you have to sort out all these issues in 15 minutes. 
So the way a system set up, it doesn't allow you to kind of, oh, you know what, what else is going on? E e elective things you want to talk about that you haven't had a chance beyond your ankle sprain and the rash and the chest pain that you've had. This is not a priority for you. In this clinic, you know what, we're going to take our time with you uh, and deal with things that you, you've wanted to deal with, but your, your practitioner yeah. hasn't had the time to do so. And I'm going to put you on the spot with this question, but at the end of the day, as a doctor, time is money. Why are you guys choosing this approach, knowing that it might be, you know, either more expensive mm -hmm. uh, or you're making a little bit less per hour? So we do very well in our family and emerge practice. And in fact, uh, like the compensation system is good, thankfully. This is a different model because it has a premium. The reality is it has a premium for us to take our time with patients mm -hmm. to do that. Otherwise... Uh, the economics of it may not make sense. Yeah. So we're providing a lot more services than it would be at a regular practice. You come in, it's kind of, it's more, again, it's it's a, what's the word, prestige or concierge type service. Yeah. Definitely. You want to delete prestige, sorry, um, <coughs> concierge type service, essentially that, uh, that comes on with a bit of a premium for it. And I think uh, there's a lot of people who want that. Uh, we won't get into the whole healthcare system and the policies around it, but I think uh, again we'll leave that. But there may be, are, are, there should be revisions potentially of the way we administer healthcare in Canada. Yeah, now but that's that, a broad topic. We won't get into. Oh that. no, that we, we can go for uh, economics. We can go on the it. you know the the just the, it. It's a long long story. I've done actually uh, with this long story. I've done a, a piece when I was in uh, university in economics about the advantages of actually completely abolishing our system. Yeah. And <laughs> I almost got expelled for how well that piece was done and like just argued my points and yeah. everything. And then, the, you know, and then at, at that point I, I got into uh, the Dean's office and it was just like, you can't bring this out. Like you can't put this out there. <laughs> okay, cool, totally fine. So just. The problem is out. economics is one factor, like you said, but there's ethical values that hold us together in Canadian, the Canadian uh, like standards, essentially, where there's equi equitable access, universal access. So as a community, Canadians don't want to give that up, and I get that. But at the same time, trying to provide universal access is becoming less feasible. Correct. So we should potentially explore at a hybrid system. And the truth is that's happening, right? In, in Quebec, there's a lot of private clinics. Uh, legislation allows them to do that. In Ontario, that's emerging in Toronto and Ottawa. Uh, so we're providing services still under OHIP, but we're providing premium services that require a bit of a membership on mm -hmm. top of that, essentially. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. At the end of the day, like, you know, we can argue one way or another. Uh, as long as people are getting the basic needs of health, that's, that's all that matters, Yeah, really. Again, really, thank you so much. Appreciate it for uh, the time and, and being on the on the podcast. And would love to uh, to check it out. I'm, I'm actually gonna. I'm really intrigued. Now. You're gonna have to come pay us a visit, of I, course. I am. I am. I'm very intrigued. Intrigued. I'm probably gonna book something right after my vacation. Amazing. Thank you for taking the time to have me. I've actually been keeping an eye on your podcast, and uh, I think it's gonna continuously emerge. You've been having great guests, and I've been privileged to be on your podcast today. Thank Appreciate you very it, much. Man. It's uh, for me. It's it's anything that we can do to help the community to bring awareness to businesses like yourself. That's that are, awesome putting out really good good service, uh, yeah. helping out the community. Uh, the whole purpose of this premise of the, this show is really to just bring some light to the city. Ottawa is not a boring city. There's so much going on. There's a lot There's of so hidden many. gems that we just don't know about. Exactly. You're right. There's so many great businesses out there that just need your attention, you know. And with that being said, thank you so much. If you guys like what you see, please don't forget to hit the bell icon so you can get all the episodes and you get alerts on every episode that comes out. If you like what you see, just hit the like button. Thank you so much. Take care.